Well, um, when I was very young, when I was in elementary school, I was interested in science in the way that a lot of elementary school kids are interested in science. When I was growing up, it was, it was very much encouraged to be interested in science. Um, um, when I was in high school, I started to think of my scientific interests when I was young as sort of naive and mechanical, and I got interested in philosophy. Um, and then, at a certain point, read about the theory of relativity and was sort of really impressed, really blown away by the thought that there were these very philosophical sounding questions, questions about the structure of space and time, for example, um, which by being sufficiently clever, you could drag into the domain where they could be, where light could be shed on them by doing certain sorts of experiments. And I was enormously uh, impressed with that. Um, um, I was enormously sort of moved uh, by that, and, um, and that encouraged an interest in the sort of boundary between, between physics and philosophy, um, <clears throat> and the ways in which um, physics could, could, when people got very smart, sort of um, um, raid certain domains that had previously belonged to philosophy and drag them into physics or drag them nearer to the border. And when I started learning about the foundations of quantum mechanics, it was clear that in an even more vivid way than was the case for relativity, there was a, uh, there was a real issue coming up uh, <clears throat> in quantum mechanics of, of um, upsetting all sorts of convictions that had previously been thought to belong in a stable way to philosophy by itself. So I guess it's things like that that got me interested at first. Well, I'm not sure that I have a preconceived idea uh, of what a quantum theory is, but there are a couple of, I would say there are two and a half ways of thinking about quantum mechanics that look to me like they have a reasonable chance of making sense. Um, one is the whole tradition of what's often called hidden variables. That's a bad name, better to call them extra variable theories or something like that. The best example we have of that is Bohmian mechanics. Um, another is the whole tradition of collapse theories. The best example <coughs> we have of that at the moment is the GRW theory. Um, and then there's a tradition of theories coming out of Everett that want to be neither one of those. I call that sort of a half a tradition because I'm a good deal less optimistic about the possibility of that ending up making some kind of clear sense than I am about the first two. But those are three ways of attempting to make sense out of quantum mechanics in, in a way that if it worked, I feel I could understand. Well, yeah, I guess, um, in the sense that quantum theory is the first time we encounter um, a kind of stochasticity that looks like it can't be eliminated by improving your technology, by improving your capacity to measure things, um, so on and so forth. Whether this is a stochasticity that's really there in the fundamental metaphysics of the world, or whether it has to do with some ignorance of initial conditions, as in statistical mechanics, but here, as opposed to in statistical mechanics, it's going to be a kind of ignorance which is inelimitable as a matter of principle. Which one of those two is the case depends on how you solve the measurement problem, and we don't know yet the right way to solve the measurement problem. So in, in, a, in a theory like the GRW theory, 
the stochasticity is going to be a genuine fundamental metaphysical feature of the world. In a theory like Bohm's theory, it isn't, but there is this interesting and unprecedented feature that although, um, that although the sort of stochasticity of the theory is purely epistemic, on a fundamental metaphysical level, the theory is deterministic, unlike in statistical mechanics, uncertainty about the initial conditions is what Shelley Goldstein and his collaborators call an absolute uncertainty. It's not the kind of uncertainty that could imaginably, even on the level of principle, be eliminated, as I said, by improving your techniques of measurement, by spending more money on, on your detectors, so on and so forth. So there is, on all the ways we know of at the moment, of making sense of quantum mechanics, a way in which a level of stochasticity imposes itself on the world or imposes itself between the world and us in a way that doesn't have a precedent in physics before that, I think, yes. Well, um, I think it's not unfair to say that um, quantum mechanical non-locality is one of the biggest surprises to have emerged from the whole scientific project, you know, the whole modern scientific project since it began in the Renaissance. Um, I think it's a really, really striking thing. Um, um, there are lots of different ways one might attempt to make sense of it. One way of attempting to make sense of it that appeals to me um, uh, has to do with seeing it as a suggestion that, um, <clears throat> um, that the, the real foundationally accurate picture of the world is something that's going on in much higher dimensions than um, than the three-dimensional space with which we're familiar, and that, you know, very crudely speaking, the explanation of the fact that by doing something to a particle over here, we can, we can immediately affect a particle over there without anything going on in the spatio-temporal interval between them, one way of coming to grips with that, and this is this high-dimensional way, is the thought that poking this just is poking this, because this and this are sort of uh, uh, this super particle in this higher dimensional space being looked at from two different, from two different angles. Well, I guess I think that uh, in circumstances where both of those fields are healthy and doing really interesting things, it's even hard to ask the question because the distinction between them isn't so clean. If you look at a conference like this, um, um, a, a certain number of, of people speaking at this conference are employed in philosophy departments, a certain number are, are employed in physics departments. It's not so easy to tell from listening to the talks which department the person is employed in. I'm somebody who was once upon a time employed in a physics department and is now employed in a philosophy department. When I write a paper, you know, my rule is that if when I'm done it has more than two equations in it, I send it to a physics journal, and if it has less than two, I send it to a philosophy journal. And the distinctions aren't so clear, in, at least in this particular subfield of foundations of physics. And I think that's a very healthy business. Um, in some sense, we're engaged in a scientific problem here. Um, that is, our goal is to write down a set of dynamical equations of motion that give a correct account of our empirical experience of the world. But the business of designing this particular set of equations, it turns out, requires a degree of philosophical sophistication and sensitivity just for the purposes of making it clear to oneself what would count as solving this problem, um, um, what would really amount to a solution to this problem. 
These kinds of things require a degree of philosophical sophistication and sensitivity that's well beyond what's usually asked of theoretical physics in their every, theoretical physicists in their everyday work. So you have a collection of physicists who are peculiarly sensitive to philosophical issues, philosophers who are particularly interested in, in issues of physics, and like I say, the degree to which a conversation like this is healthy, it seems to me, varies inversely with the degree to which a clean distinction can be made between the people who are doing physics and the people who are doing philosophy. There are a bunch of them in all sorts of different directions. There are technical problems um, that have to do with extending the various solutions to the measurement problem that we understand well in the context of non-relativistic quantum mechanics to the relativistic case. There are more philosophical sorts of problems about clarifying um, um, the, the philosophical analysis of the idea of chance and probability and it turns out that a clear philosophical analysis of these concepts turns out to be very urgently needed in order to make the appropriate sorts of scientific progress um, with various solutions to the measurement problem. Um, um, I guess I would say it's problems in those two general classes that, uh, that constitute what seem to me the most urgent problems at the moment.